This video is brought to you by Patreon. Patreon! Can you dig it? One of the significant changes Nickelodeon made once the torch was passed from Cy Schneider to Jerry Laybourne was to gradually introduce animation into the channel's schedule. And I do mean gradually, with exactly two animated shows a year. In 1984, we were introduced to Danger Mouse, an English language action adventure show, and Bell and Sebastian, a Japanese anime about the journey of a young boy. This proved successful, so in 1985, Nickelodeon tried to replicate that dynamic with Star Trek, an English language action adventure show, and The Adventures of the Little Prince, a Japanese show about the journey of a young boy. It was a tad less successful. So for 1986, Nick opted for a different tactic, a new theme for that year's two animated shows. French Weirdness. On June 30th, Nickelodeon premiered the Japanese-French co-production The Mysterious Cities of Gold, and followed that up in October with solo French production Spartacus and the Sun Beneath the Sea. Both shows science fiction fantasies about ancient advanced civilizations and the quest to reclaim them. Both shows with a cast of bright-eyed children and buff adult men who can do the action scenes. Both shows that make the now grown-ups of today go, Wait, was that a real cartoon or, or did I just dream it? So let's see how real they were. Are the cities of gold real or just a legend? Join Esteban and his friends as they search for the treasure of the mysterious cities of gold, only on Nickelodeon. The Mysterious Cities of Gold was a 39-episode, single-season anime that originally aired on NHK in Japan from 1982 to 1983. This highly serialized program tells the story of Esteban, a young orphan boy living in Spain in 1532. Esteban was found as an infant on a sinking ship by the navigator Mendoza, and found with him a strange amulet that implies a connection to the seven lost cities of gold, mythical places of riches and power. Esteban also seems to have a supernatural connection to the sun, as if he could command the storm clouds to part. Mendoza thinks Esteban is the key to finding these cities, so in the dead of night, he brings the boy along as a stowaway in a ship headed from Spain to South America. In the hold of the ship, Esteban finds Zia, a young Inca girl, daughter of a high priest. Zia possesses an amulet very similar to Esteban's, and in their current predicament, hidden in the bowels of the ship, the two children become fast friends. From now on, I'm here and I'll protect you. We'll always be together, all right? <laughs> All right. <laughs> However, the oceans bring many dangers, and it's not long before the ship sinks, leaving Esteban, Zia, Mendoza, and two other sailors, Sancho and Pedro, lost at sea in a makeshift raft. They end up washing ashore on a desert island with just two inhabitants, Tao, the last living descendant of a lost civilization, and Coca Petal, Tao's chatty chubby parrot. The young boy spends his days poring over technical manuals left behind, learning sciences beyond that of the present world, in hopes to unlock the great machines of his people. When the world was old, the kingdom of Hiva was the oldest of all the lands. It lay out into the ocean, an immense continent stretching across the sea. Hiva was a rich land. They had some machines that moved faster than animals, and other machines that could fly higher than birds. Great machines like the Solaris, a solar-powered ship with amazing weaponry, and the Golden Condor, a flying machine of great elegance. With these tools in hand, our heroes set out to find the cities of gold, which may hold the answers to Esteban's origins, the location of Zia's father, and the technological marvels of Tao's people. Also, you know, just a butt-ton of gold. 
It's not that easy, of course, for South America is under constant conflict between Spanish invaders and the native civilizations. Our protagonists constantly find themselves in the middle of violent confrontations. They're taken prisoner by different factions and are racing against other, much less noble explorers to see who can find the Golden City first. And as they search for clues among the ruins, it becomes clear that there's more to the City of Gold than anyone could have thought. The Mysterious Cities of Gold is a very serialized program, easily the most continuity-heavy thing we've seen on Nickelodeon thus far. Every episode is a direct continuation of the next. There isn't any filler to speak of. No one-off characters, no plot threads that don't tie into the central plot. Even Bell and Sebastian, Nickelodeon's continuity heavyweight champion before this point, had smaller stories to break things up. Not here. For many, the serialization is a big plus for those who like to invest in long-form storytelling, those who want to watch the plot progress and these characters grow in virtually real time. I love that kind of stuff too, but the intense serialization can also be argued to be a detriment. While there is a previously on segment at the beginning of an episode and a next time segment at the end of an episode, they can only do so much, and you are expected to keep track of a lot of things where characters are in relation to each other, what goals they've already accomplished, and what part of this intricate chain of puzzles and clues they are currently working through. It's a challenging show to jump into midstream. If you haven't been following from episode one, you can get lost pretty quickly. And Lord help you if you go on vacation and can't watch Nickelodeon for a week. When you come back and everything's changed. Wait, when we left to see the Hoover Dam, Esteban, Zia, and Tao were trying to escape Commander Gomez through a series of tunnels, and when we came back they were on a giant golden bird? What did I miss? Who are these people? New bad guys, what? This being ages before the internet, you had to hope that you had friends who also watched the show and could help you put the pieces together. But then, that's also a strength of the show. It promotes playground discussion. You just gotta talk about it. One of the things you gotta talk about on the playground is how violent the show is. Characters are constantly under the threat of death, and a lot of secondary characters and background characters get killed on screen. Not in a graphic way, I don't think there's a drop of blood in the entire show, but people are frequently being shot with guns and bows, falling off cliffs, having avalanches come down on top of them, drowning, burning to death, the death count in this show is high. This in itself isn't an issue, it comes down to taste. You know how much violence you can personally stomach and it's up to you if Mysterious Cities of Gold crosses your line. But it is an exceptional amount of violence for Nickelodeon. While there is a light spattering of action programs through the channel's 40 plus year run, some even more graphic than this show, Nickelodeon has never been known as a place for action television and it especially wasn't known for that in 1986. The channel was born as a cable alternative to PBS, and Jerry Laybourne was very particular about not running ads for violent toys, including passing on what would have been a very lucrative partnership with Laser Tag. But here's Mysterious Cities of Gold, between episodes of Bell and Sebastian and Danger Mouse, just stabbing an old guy. I helped to build this village. The village of the new sun means so much to me. I cannot abandon it now. Ah! Oh, Papa Kamayo, are you hurt? Oh, oh no. Quickly, come here and help, all of you. Papa Kamayo has been wounded. What's that? Oh, I got him. I killed the old fool. I know our great leader, Minotaur, will give me a special reward. <laughs> Do not misunderstand me. Neither of these things, the strict serialization or the violence, are bad. They're just completely uncharacteristic of Nickelodeon's priorities at this time, placing the Mysterious Seas of Gold as a very unique product for the channel. There was nothing else like it on Nick. So what exactly is Mysterious Seas of Gold trying to accomplish here? And why might it have appealed to Nickelodeon? Well, let's roll back the clock all the way back to 1971 and across the Pacific to Luxembourg. Radio Television Luxembourg, or RTL, was, it still is, a major media company that produced loads of television for all across Europe. In 1971, they were looking to develop a new animation production division and turned to a baby-faced French businessman named Jean Chalopon to create it. 
The end result was Diffusion Information Communications, or as you probably know it as... Deke produced a few small French shows through the 70s, along with lots of commercial work, but Chalapin wanted to make something epic. Deke didn't have the resources to do that on their own, so the company reached out to Japan, specifically to TMS Entertainment. The end result was Ulysses 31, a science fiction reimagining of Homer's Odyssey. Premiering in 1981, this was the first Deke show to reach English-speaking audiences. The show really put the studio on the map. While working in Japan, Shalapun met and became friends with Mitsuru Kaneko. You might remember him for his production company, MK Company, which around the same time Ulysses 31 was in production, was working on a little show called Bell and Sebastian. This was the height of what I've come to call Eurocentric anime, a trend in Japanese television animation of adapting stories about European characters from Western source materials. Bell and Sebastian, a show about a boy's long trek across Spain to find his long-lost family, did pretty well, and Kaneko was looking for some new Eurocentric source material to tap into. What he chose was The King's Fifth, by American author Scott O'Dell. Let's address that now. Outside of a few character names and the general idea of conquistadors search the Americas for the seven cities of gold, the book and the show have almost nothing to do with each other. In the book, Esteban and Zia are teenagers, Esteban is a cartographer with no secret origins and no sun-summoning superpowers, Zia isn't an Inca but a Native American, the Conquistador's mission take them to New Mexico and Arizona instead of South America, Tao isn't in the book, and neither are all the fantastical fantasy and science fiction elements. No Solaris, no Golden Condor, no Olmex. The book is a pretty straightforward piece of historical fiction about how greed motivates people. The show is a psychedelic pulp serial with mechs. Rolling back a bit, Deke would handle the French side of things, but instead of MK Company, the Japanese production was handed to Studio Piero, barely two years old at the time, but already finding success in other Eurocentric anime, such as The Wonderful Adventures of Nils. Around this time, NHK, Japan's national broadcasting organization, was looking for educational material for their channel, and the Mysterious Cities of Gold had some enticing qualities, being based off of a book, having a story in a historical setting. But to seal the deal, it was decided to make the show part documentary. Esteban in the story has set out to find the cities of gold. Nearly 600 years ago, European explorers searched everywhere in the New World of America for the same golden cities. At the end of each episode of The Mysterious Cities of Gold, there's a mini-documentary on matters relating to the day's stories. Averaging about two and a half minutes, these documentaries broach the subject of South America's native populations and history, the explorers, conquerors, and colonists who came to the continent, the local wildlife and geography, and it's a bit of a mixed bag. I didn't have time to fact check all 39 of these documentaries, but a couple of the common lies you heard in elementary school do slip through the crack. You know, good old Christopher Columbus praise. Then came Christopher Columbus and Spanish success. He was sure the earth was a globe and set out to be the first to find a new sea route to India by going around the other way. But it's not a complete wash. Put a pin on that, we'll come back to the documentaries in a bit. The point is, with them, the mysterious cities of gold could be classified as educational and get the green light. On the French side of things, Chalapun brought in his longtime collaborator and childhood friend, Bernard Darez, to write and direct. On the Japanese side, many of the people who worked on the wonderful adventures of Nil came on board. Chief animation director duties were given to Hisayuki Toriumi, who directed the original Gachaman series in 1972. The result is a healthy mix of French and Japanese animation styles. Um, if you look at the, the animation today, you will see very quickly that you know there is a very French part in you know, the background and the, the color and the, um, the way it is. Is that really Bernard Bernard touch? And it is quite French. On the other side, the Japanese uh, did a lot of the character drawings, and 
uh, you know, Esteban has the big eyes, small nose of uh, the Japanese character. So it was a combination of both. Character design was handled by Toshiyasu Okada, who had done a lot of the work on Eurocentric animes such as Heidi, A Girl of the Alps, and A Dog of Flanders, as well as some of the formative early magical girl shows like Sally the Witch and Mako the Mermaid. Art director Mitsuki Nakamura also came from Gachamon and is especially well known for his work in Mobile Suit Gundam. You see the Golden Condor and the Ship of the Old Mechs and you just know somebody from Mecha Anime was involved. The end result is a very engaging visual style, especially for the modest budget they had. The characters are expressive with strong silhouettes, the young characters are allowed more cartoony movements than the adults, the design of the ancient advanced technology, a bit of Aztec, Maya, and Inca designs with the gears and crystal punk of your favorite Atlantis stories no doubt inspired many a child's imaginations. While the show can feel flat at times, it does a lot with light and shadow. Every once in a while the show will treat itself to a bit of flourish, a moment of fluid action, or better yet, an artistic abstract. Like here's the show's representation of seasickness. Also, destruction. Lots and lots of destruction. There isn't a structure, mountain path, or cave that doesn't get totally wrecked by the end of the show, shown in great detail. A little less interesting was the music. The original score produced by the Japanese team was fine. Incidental orchestra for the most part, nothing too memorable, and lots of moments without music at all. It's too understated. Deke agreed. They weren't too happy about it, felt it lacked identity. So when it came time to do dubbing for the European market, Deke opted to completely replace the soundtrack with one composed by a couple of Israeli chaps, Shuki Levy and Haim Saban. Yes, you're reading that right. The guys who created Power Rangers did the soundtrack for the Mysterious Cities of Gold. We'll be seeing more of them in the future, especially Saban. The new soundtrack could not be any more different. A mix of flute and guitar heavy world music meant to evoke the show's South American setting, and wobbly synthesizers to give the show an otherworldly strangeness. Yeah, it's night and day. You could argue that the new soundtrack is too much, but it definitely gives the show a musical identity all its own. Oh, and the theme song. The original Japanese theme is... I mean, it's, it's different from the American one. Yeah, try your best. It really, uh, really gets your blood pumping, don't it? Oh no, the Spanish army is attacking that Inca fort. Guess I'll try my best. The new theme from Levy and Saban is just way more energizing and way more aesthetically appropriate. <laughs> Of 
The Mysterious Series of Gold actually didn't do too well. I mean, it did okay in Japan, but not good enough to warrant the second season they were planning for. The first season ends with only one of the seven golden cities discovered, Esteban, Zia, and Teo loading up into the gold condor to find the other six. The idea being that each season would take place on a different continent. Alas, a second season wasn't commissioned in Japan, and Deke just couldn't produce the show on their own. Deke actually had a great deal of trouble selling the mysterious cities of gold in other markets, which is why it took a few years before an English dub could be produced. The English dub had to pull double duty, as it was being picked up by both Nickelodeon and the BBC at the same time. It couldn't sound too American for the British, and it couldn't sound too British for the Americans, so they split the difference and cast Canadians. In the United States, they found it very difficult to understand British accents throughout a good part of the United States. People have that problem. And in, in Britain, the, the American accent at times was felt to be too strong. So Canada was in, in a neutral area. That's Howard Rishpan, the director of the English dubbing team, as well as the English voice of Mendoza. He already had a working relationship with Nickelodeon, heading the dub team for the channel-produced English dub of Bell and Sebastian a few years earlier. It was decided that, instead of the usual practice of having women play the roles of children, actual age-appropriate young voice actors would be cast in the lead roles, with Shiraz Adam playing Esteban and Janice Chackelson playing Zia. The voice actor for Tao, Adrian Knight, was also the voice of the titular Sebastian in Bell and Sebastian. Perhaps in the first city, the builders only knew about using stone-locking devices, but by the time they built the second city, they were learning how to use the power of the sun. So for the third city, they've probably used some more complex solar-powered block for the doors. That's it! That's the key! Sunlight! The dubbing in Mysterious Seeds of Gold is pretty typical of dubbing of this vintage. Dialogue delivered with odd pacing, often too quickly, in order to match the lip movements of the original footage. It's not atrocious, though, and a small miracle when you consider the child actors involved. Adam was only 10 years old at the time. Honestly, looking at the process, with the dialogue moving past super quickly, with lines to indicate how long a word should take to say, it's amazing it comes through at all. With them co-producing the English dub, it's clear that Nickelodeon believed in the Mysterious Cities of Gold, despite it being so unlike their other programs. Part of that might just be to build and maintain working relationships. The show shares crew with Bell and Sebastian, and that worked out pretty well for the channel. This would also not be the only time Nickelodeon would raid Deke's library. This is just me theory crafting. I have zero evidence of this. But maybe taking on this less successful show from Deke's library was a necessary step before the channel could get their hands on Inspector Gadget and Heathcliff in the following years. You might guess the educational element played a factor too. The mini documentaries might have been enough to sell this show in the Cy Schneider era, and while the green vegetable material of the channel's first handful of years had been weeded out by this point, Jerry Laybourne wasn't opposed to educational material, so long as it was engaging and fun for kids, which Mysterious Cities of Gold most certainly qualifies. The problem with that idea is that Nickelodeon ended up cutting the documentaries for time. Nickelodeon had become very reliant on advertising, and this show was not created for commercial television, each episode averaging about 27 minutes, not enough time for ad breaks. So take out the documentaries, that's two and a half minutes freed up, and that's equal to five Teddy Grahams commercials. While I understand the logic in cutting the documentaries, I actually think it's a bit sad they're gone. Yes, there were detectable inaccuracies in some of them, but I think the documentaries are important in providing Mysterious Seas of Gold with some much needed context. Because this is, first and foremost, a show about a fantastical version of South America being told by people who are not South American. This French-Japanese production takes peoples, arts, architectures, and cultures that are not their own and use them to tell a historical science fiction tale about a white kid. It's, shall we say, a tricky needle to thread. One you probably shouldn't be trying to thread in the first place. But in fairness, The Mysterious Seas of Gold does try to put in the work. For one thing, the Spanish conquistadors are unambiguously the bad guys. 
their conquests, theft, and murder of the Inca and Maya civilizations are very clearly awful crimes, and the show doesn't shy away from that. While the show gets into some uncomfortable white savior territory with Esteban, it is eventually revealed that Esteban is of mixed ethnicity. That's not enough to counter the white savior stuff, but at least they tried. The three Spanish characters you could call good guys lean more towards moral ambiguity. They're not so much allies to the children as they are also enemies to the conquistadors. Sancho and Pedro are greedy, cowardly, and untrustworthy at the best of times. It's only their blundering incompetence that keep them from being a threat to the children. Mendoza is a bit of a Han Solo type, a cool, sexy action hero who's only here for the money. He lies, he plots, and oh yeah, he was the guy who kidnapped Zia in the first place. The kids are never sure if they can trust him, but they need his help. Of course, that builds into a character arc for Mendoza, where he grows attached to the children and then has to decide between doing the right thing or getting his gold. It's cheesy, but I do love a good, chaotic, neutral character decides to help the good guys moment. Come on, Mendoza, we can leave right now. We've got everything we need. We know where the cities are going. And we borrowed enough food for a month. Come on, come on, we're wasting time. I was a fool to hire such worthless idiots as you two. What did you say, Mendoza? What? You put those things back where you found them right now. I have dealt with these two. Esteban, we will fight alongside you. Mendoza, you're prepared to fight too? Yes, we'll show these Olmecs how Spaniards fight their battles. They're in for a surprise. But then they kind of ruin it by giving Mendoza a bunch of gold anyway. Like, no, the whole point of his character arc is that he has to choose between his greed or doing the right thing. You can't let him have both. The Incas and the Mayans are not shown to be magical or unknowable. They're not turned into fantasy races for the sake of the story. There are certainly inaccuracies in how their cultures are portrayed that I'm not educated enough to detect, but their cultures are not dramatically sensationalized for this pulp narrative. There are sensationalized tribes of people in the show, but they're 100% fictional, like this tribe of red-headed, bearskin-wearing giants. And oh yeah, a group of buff, beautiful Amazon warrior women show up, because sometimes pulp adventures are just going to do that. Women. Listen to me. We come in peace. We don't want to fight. Silence. That's enough, my dear. But you know that these are purely fictional tribes, not the actual people of South America, because of the documentaries. The documentaries talk about the Incas and the Mayans. They don't talk about the giants or the erotic fantasy tribe. The documentaries present the real faces of South America, the descendants of centuries of bloody history. It's the show going, okay, you've seen our version, now here's the real thing. Here's how these people live. Here's the history that got us to this point. This direct act of separating fact from fiction goes a long way. Except for the Olmecs. They do mess that up. Introduced in the final quarter of the show, these Nosferatu-looking guys bring the show into full-blown science fiction, introducing things like laser weapons, flying machines, suspended animation, and just all the stethoscopes. The remnants of an advanced ancient civilization they replace the Spanish as the big bad guys of the story. And unlike the giants or the Amazon women, it's implied that these guys are based on the actual Olmec civilization. The real world Olmecs are the earliest Mesoamerican civilization that we know of. They were real people, not a hypothetical civilization like Atlantis. And they weren't lost to time. Olmec writing and architecture and art, highly detailed statues, have survived we know a decent amount of things about them, and they certainly weren't bat monsters. Unlike the giants and the Amazon women, 
we do get a documentary on the mysteries of the Olmecs, confirming to the audience that these guys were real. A mysterious people lived in Mexico called the Olmecs. Until about a hundred years ago, no one knew anything about them. Even now, very little is known about their history or what happened to them, except that they seem to have suddenly disappeared just before the Aztecs came to power. Between this and Mendoza getting his gold when he shouldn't have, the show doesn't really stick the landing the way it should. I do believe the show's heart was in the right place. It made a lot of effort to not be disrespectful to these cultures, but Nickelodeon cutting the documentaries meant losing a critical part of that. Regardless, it's always better to have people of these cultures tell the stories of those cultures. The Mysterious Cities of Gold was never much of a headliner for Nickelodeon, and as time moved on, it kind of got swept under the rug. By 1989, it was airing at the ungodly hour of 5 a.m., and it aired for the final time on June 30th, 1990, exactly four years to the day after its premiere. Over time, the show has gained a rather substantial cult following, and was an off-treasured show for tape traders in the late 1990s through the 2000s. In 2012, fans hit the jackpot, first with a solid DVD release of the complete series, and then with a whole new series. This new Mysterious Cities of Gold is a direct continuation of the 1982 show, following the adventures of Esteban, Zia, and Tao as they fly around the globe, looking for the other cities of gold. I haven't been able to watch the new show at length, but it's been pretty well received. The Mysterious Cities of Gold was unlike anything Nickelodeon had aired. Serialized, violent, beautiful, and uncomfortably complex in a way that the channel had never seen, and really wouldn't see again until 2005. Its cult classic status is well deserved. It's thrilling stuff, even today, and very much worth the watch, especially with a friend. The show wants you to talk about it. You know, really, the cities of gold were the friends we made along the way. Nick, 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 Next time, more French weirdness. Look, I'm still trying to figure this one out. I'll, I'll get back to you. Today's research shout-out goes to, well, the Mysterious Cities of Gold DVD set. In the age of Blu-ray, it seems special features have become a lost art. This here is the best DVD set for any Nickelodeon show I've come across thus far. Over an hour of interviews with cast and crew, production profiles, artwork, storyboards, you couldn't ask for more. Thank you all for watching. If you'd like to support Knickknacks and other Poparina projects, consider contributing to my Patreon. Every dollar goes to research materials, production values, and grilled cheese sandwiches. You can also support the Poparina by liking the video, subscribing to the channel, hitting that bell icon for notifications, leaving a comment, following me on Twitter, sending a one-time donation through Coffee or PayPal, and sharing knickknacks with all your friends. Goodbye. Till next time.